Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I am Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. On today's show, cable news has a real anchorman vibe this morning with big stars leaving their networks. I mean, this really got out of hand fast. Snap also is one Kylie Jenner tweet away from reversing course on another unpopular redesign. Then we'll talk about LVMH making its claim as the Apple of Europe. Educate Neil with another edition of Toby's Trends and finish up with a lawsuit featuring the songbird of our generation, Ed Sheeran. Neil, it's Tuesday, April 25th. Let's ride. Toby, Joe Biden really reminded me of you this morning because he's wrapping up an 18-hole round of golf and he wants to go around another time. Oh my God. That's a Toby classic. He launched, Biden launched his reelection bid for 2024 in a video message this morning. Unlike you, though, he's 80 years old. I know. And he wants to go around another time. It's actually going to be crazy. He would be 86 by the end of his, his second term if he were to be reelected. Man, I, we, we've talked about it, but we live in a stuck culture. Everything just repeats over and over again. But, I mean, good for Joe. I guess he's feeling, he's feeling young. He's feeling, feeling sprightly. sprightly. Uh, the Republican National Committee came back with a video about, you know, after, after Biden announced his reelection. And it was AI generated. And it, and it painted this picture of a dystopian future with Biden at the helm for another four years. And it was made up of completely AI generated images. And it just struck me that this is going to be an AI race. A wild election cycle with AI. That is the dystopian future right there, by the way. Right. The fact that AI is generating political videos. So we're in for a doozy. We're in That's for a doozy. Like the debates are going to be people are just going to AI them up and yeah. make people say stuff that they didn't say. Um, it is going to be really interesting. AI is going to be a huge factor in the 2024 presidential election, something we didn't think we'd say six months ago. For sure. All right. Uh, let's go to our first story. If anyone is looking for a TV hosting gig, there are two juicy slots available, one on Fox News at 8 p.m. and the other on CNN at 6 a.m. Waking up is not that hard, trust us. <laughs> In an absolute TV host bloodbath yesterday, both Fox News' Tucker Carlson and CNN's Don Lemon were forced out of their jobs. Let's start with Tucker, who is perhaps the most powerful TV journalist in the U.S. right now. He's a big Trump supporter who pushed anti-immigrant and sometimes racist ideas that only gained influence after the 2020 election. His populist message, though, resonated with a lot of Fox viewers and resulted in him becoming an absolute ratings powerhouse. So his exit came as a huge shock yesterday. Everyone was like, are you sure? <laughs> Everyone was like, are we sure we can trust this Twitter account that, <laughs> right. that just said that Tucker is leaving? Because it is so surprising. Yeah. I mean, I have written down that Tucker absolutely rips on ratings. And by that, I mean, he pulls 3 million viewers regularly, which is just a wild stat in today's era of like streaming and our attention being so fragmented. He's literally the top non-sports show on cable, which just goes to show how much yeah. influence he has. And just to kind of put it in context on some of his rivals, NBC, MSNBC and CNN average roughly 1 million to 700,000 viewers in that same time slot. So he's at least three times, a little bit over three times uh, his competitors. Yeah. So obviously a huge decision for, for Fox. The stock dropped 500 million on yeah, the news, three percent, three percent, yeah, on the news that it um, that he was leaving. Yeah. So definitely not a decision that Fox made lightly. No. So why did they push him out? We don't know exactly why, but obviously this comes on the heels of this massive settlement that Fox had to pay Dominion over seven hundred eighty-seven million dollars about conspiracy theories related to the twenty twenty election. Uh, Carlson didn't necessarily have a lot to do with that specific lawsuit, but I think it spooked uh, Chairman R R Rupert Murdoch, who was like, I don't want any more legal challenges. Apparently, Rupert, <laughs> you can be on his good side and be his pal, and then he'll turn on you in an instant like he did with Roger Ailes and Bill O'Reilly. So uh, maybe, so Carlson seems to have a potential legal liability going forward. He's pushed this theory that this guy, Ray Epps, who was at the January 6th riot, was a secret government agent, and Epps has threatened legal action. And then also there's this former producer, Abby Grossberg, has sued Fox over misogyny on Carlson's team. It was also discovered in text that uh, Carlson used derogatory language toward Trump lawyer Sidney Powell and kind of just trashed Fox management in these texts that came out yeah. from the lawsuit. So it just feels like Carlson was kind of just a bad employee, he was trashing his boxes. And who wants that around? Well, it was I, I saw both sides of the equation where people were like, 
holy crap, like what did he do yeah. that made him like so unceremoniously leave the network? But then you list all those things and you're kind of like, okay, what didn't he do <laughs> to incite them to decide yeah. to part ways? So yeah, it, it's a whole lot of everything. It could Maybe there's something else that's going to leak in the, in the coming days, but it does seem like it was a big step to make, but like once you start putting the pieces together, you can see how they, they reach the conclusion. We'll see what happens to Fox going forward because they basically pushed out their biggest star. And now they have this yeah. gaping hole at 8 p.m., which is a huge time slot for primetime viewership. I got to give my dad uh, credit for this metaphor, but he texted me yesterday. He was like, Tom Brady, this is like Tom Brady leaving the, the Patriots and Bill Belichick after a huge amount of success together. In other words, is Tucker's success the result of the system of Fox News or is he a unique <laughs> talent? He's a system news host. That's what we're that's what we're figuring out. Yeah. Credit to your dad on that one. That's a good metaphor. Uh, we can we should talk about Don Lemon, too, because he's the other big star at uh, CNN who was fired yesterday. <laughs> Crazy. You said it was a bloodbath. It, it was a bloodbath. Yeah. Lemon was not as surprising as Tucker because he's been just, there's been a ton of controversy around Don Lemon in the past year over sexist comments he made on the show, other allegations of misogyny behind the scenes. The biggest face palm for Lemon was when he said Republican presidential candidate Nick, he, Nikki Haley isn't in her prime, which got him a uh, you know, public rebuke from CNN chairman Chris Licht, and he was kind of on uh, icy footing. That's not the term. <laughs> Uncertain footing. <laughs> Uncertain footing. Yeah. He was on thin ice. I think I finally got that um, for a couple months, and then they were just like, this guy's not worth it because he's kind of a loose cannon. We don't know what he's going to say it's, on the air. It's a tough time to be a TV show host. Luckily, we are just podcasts in YouTube show host, so hopefully we'll we'll be spared from the bloodbath. Um, okay, Neil, let's move on and jump into the world of luxury fashion. So yesterday, LVMH became the first European company to surpass a five hundred billion dollar market cap. It also further cemented CEO Bernard Arnault's place as the richest man in the world with a fortune of two hundred forty billion dollars. He's leaving Musk and Bezos in the dust. Musk is at 173 billion. He's absolutely he's almost lapping Musk at this point. Yeah. So it's actually been a crazy rise for LVMH over the last couple of years. So the stock is up 33% this year alone. And one of the big reasons it is it comes back to China. So China is a massive market for luxury goods. And as it's gra gradually reopened in the wake of COVID, it sent LVMH's stock price soaring. So a lot of people are comparing LVMH to kind of the big tech and specifically yeah the apple of of europe and so people are saying that these are both these industry giants who sell these kind of wallet busting products these really expensive products that thrive even among economic uncertainty and downturns so it is almost like this recession proof industry we're seeing so it's crazy bernard is running away with with the richest man on earth title and he's running a very succession like operation too yeah yeah we have to talk about the succession thing because it is pretty juicy so he had he's 74 years old he has five adult kids or at least uh, over over the age of 24 they all run various departments in the business the eldest child runs um dior yeah so they so that's kind of like the biggest one but they run like tag heuer watch brand and they're just kind of sp spaced out throughout this business and apparently he puts them through these tests like this audition so he holds every month he holds a 90 minute lunch where he has these discussion topics on his ipad and just kind of asks people ask his kids questions Oof. it's a very logan roy uh, you know social yeah. experiment to see what they're gonna say so it seems like a pretty high pressure environment about who's gonna succeed him it's actually very critical yeah decision. It's, it's extremely succession like it it's kind of crazy yeah there's a 24 year old running yeah tag who are which is one of the biggest like brands under the the umbrella so honestly lvmh is this massive conglomerate it is acquired its way to the current market cap it's it's at so i have a little quiz for you neil i'm gonna give you some brands and you have to tell me whether or not you think it's owned by lvmh okay i think I, I think i can do this okay brand number one sephora no, that's uh, Inditex, I think. Sephora is owned by LVMH. Oh, whoops. <laughs> oh, Balenciaga. No. Balenciaga is not owned by okay. LVMH. Birkenstock. Birkenstock, I will say no. Yes. Oh, God. It's crazy. You think of it as luxury, but it's technically a leather good. So. Yeah. Off-white. Uh, yes. That is, yes. yes. Virgil uh, Abloh. Uh, yep. Fenty Beauty. Fenty, mm, yes. Yes. <laughs> I know. It's all these the celebrity brands. And then final one, Crocs. 
Crocs is definitely not his own <laughs> not. public company. Dang it. Couldn't get you with that one. Yeah. So takeaway here, I think, is that luxury is like an innate human need, just like a smartphone. And I think the comparisons between tech and luxury uh, are really apt. And the I just want to end on this L'Oreal CEO. <laughs> he had L'Oreal's also crushing it and Hermes and all the other French luxury companies. But he said in a recent earnings call that beauty is an essential need and the quest for beauty is a never ending quest. <laughs> And I don't it's know. True. I just like feel that in my bones. Essential is is a heavy word there. All right, let's move on to the banking sector. So, First Republic Bank not in a good place. The regional lender that caters to wealthy people got caught up in the SVB collapse and yesterday revealed the damage. There was a lot of damage. First Republic lost more than $100 billion in deposits last quarter alone, which was a 41% drop. That plunge would have been more than 50% had the big banks did not rallied together to plug First Republic with $30 billion of deposits as a sign of confidence in the banking sector. But there is still very little confidence in First Republic. The bank is planning to lay off up to 25% of its workforce, cut executive compensation, compensation, and pursue strategic options. And whenever anybody says they're pursuing strategic options, it's not, good. not a good sign. Plus, execs hung up on their earnings call after 12 minutes without taking any questions. Also not a good look. Shades of 2008 for sure. Whenever, yeah, you're not taking questions on your earnings call, not a good look. But so, yeah, we were kind of digging into, like, why did First Republic in particular – be so affected by the fallout from SVB. One, it's that similar sort of regional bank. It's not considered one of the big banks. And two, it kind of cater to the same wealthy sort of clientele. Mm -hmm. It's a San Francisco-based bank. So you can see how it kind of mirrors SVB a little bit. So that's why it got caught up in the SVB drama. But we also learned that the SVB B drama can be attributed a little bit to social media. Right, because after after there was this bank run, people were saying, okay, well, all these VCs were tweeting about it on social media, and did that actually lead to a bank run? Did that fuel it? Um, in the past, social media didn't exist, and bank runs still happened, but did this particular bank run, was that a result of all these VCs saying, yank, you know, in all caps, saying, yank your money out, yank your money out? And so this is the first piece of official academic research that was that was published on the impact of those tweets. And this team of five uh, professors concluded that social media posts did amplify the bank run on SVB and said that banks that were talked about on social media would be at more at risk of bank runs in the future. To, to me, it was a very logical conclusion. Like, of course, when you, there's more chatter around a, a, a bank, a specifically a certain bank, you're going to see outsized uh, activity around the mm -hmm. bank stock, around the deposits and the withdrawals. So to me, that was very logical, but it was interesting to see an academically quantify yeah. this thing that we all kind of deep down. And that's do. why there's research, because we can put data on it. I mean, we can have these intuitions and these gut checks where it's like, well, obviously this is happening, but... Uh, sure. People got to go to the data and find out. For sure. All right. Like everyone else, Snap has released an AI chat bot. This one sits at the top of its chat tab where you can ask it questions and talk with it. However, like Snap's infamous redesign of 2018, users are rebelling against it. Over the past week, Snap's average App Store review in the U.S. was 1.67. And 75% of these reviews have been one star. I don't think that's good. The number of daily reviews has jumped 5x in the past week. The top keyword in those reviews, AI. Yeah. It, people are very not happy <laughs> about this. Snap, um, Sensor Tower, who helped kind of parse through this data, gives each term an impact score, and they rate it on a scale of negative 10 to positive to plus 10, with negative 10 being the most negative thing and most negative sentiment you can have. These ratings had an average impact score of negative 9.2. Yeah. So anytime someone mentioned AI, they were mentioning it in the same sentence as, we hate this yeah. AI. And my takeaway, this is honestly, one, people hate app redesigns. Like They moan and get mad at Whenever anything changed, like, yeah, you mentioned the redesign in 2018. They had another redesign in 2020 where people just exploded. And then now, a couple years later, you don't even remember it at this point. So I think, number one, people just don't like change. But then number two, the fact that it's taking up this real estate at the top of your chats, that's what's really pissing people off. And the fact that you can't remove right. it unless... You pay. You pay for Snapchat right. Plus. They're, they 
Yeah. Yeah. The history of this thing is that it only rolled out to Snapchat Plus subscribers, which is their paid subscription, which seems to be way more successful than Twitter's, by the way. Yeah, it's doing well. And then uh, they rolled it out to the public. The problem was that it became an opt out situation, not an opt in. So you, the only way you can remove it now is by paying. Right. And the, the, they're doubly mad, too, because there's also the there's a, a chat box that's yeah. my Snapchat where Snapchat can send you like product updates and they can say like happy Thanksgiving on holidays. So now there's two Snapchat chats that are pinned to your top of your chats. So people are just like really angry with how much real estate's taking up. There, people still use Snapchat. A ton of people still use Snapchat. And honestly, that's one of the concerns about this my AI is that a lot of kids use Snapchat. Right. And so you're now turning these, these AI loose to children and the AI has been saying some like age inappropriate things. Like it's been telling 15 year olds how to cover up the smell of alcohol after you throw a party or something like that. Like giving like sex that advice. That would be helpful. I know. Actually. So it, it, it is one of those, this is one of the Pandora's boxes of AIs. Like what happens when you turn a chat bot loose to an audience mostly of children. So Snap has a lot of like parental uh, controls to put in place, some age restrictions to put in place. So this is definitely one of the AIs I'm most closely monitoring mm. because kids always find a way to break stuff and hijack stuff. So I really am interested to see how, yeah, th this AI fares going forward. It's unclear whether this is ready for prime time though. And I saw this one analyst say that in the AI race, Snap is collateral damage forced to implement before their competitors do or otherwise they'll lose. So I, it feels like people are, you know, you have to put an AI chatbot out no matter right. if it's ready or not, or else you'll seen at, you'll be seen as living in 2019. And so maybe all of these competitors are, all of these social media companies and tech companies are rolling out these AI chatbots just to say they have one. Mm -hmm. And it may not be ready. It may still have all of these kinks and it may be showing up in your feed and not be, be of value to users. But, you know, especially public companies feel like they need to right. put this forth to satisfy investors even when they're not ready. Yeah. I'm long-term bullish on it. Honestly, I think Snap will figure it out. It does make sense to have a chat. They have a chat function already. Yeah. So I think they'll figure it out, but I do think you're correct. They rolled it out a little too early. Um, okay, Neil, we're going to now move on to our favorite Tuesday segment, Toby's Trends. So today our trend is all about a game that teachers and parents alike cannot get their children to stop playing. When they're getting ready for school, playing. When they're in school, playing. So what is this trendy new online game that has children glued to their phones? It's chess. It's the world's oldest game. So chess is so unbelievably hot right now, and I personally am super excited by this. I'll give you some quick numbers just to show how big chess is right now. So we all remember that chess got that pandemic boost from Queen's Gambit when it came out. So before Queen's Gambit came out, chess.com's average daily user count was right around 1.5 million. After Ch Queen's Gambit came out, that rose to five, five to seven million. Mm -hmm. So a huge jump there. Right now, it's currently at 12 million daily users. So this is not a Queen's Gambit thing at all. We are beyond Queen's Gambit at this point because it's, it's doubled again. And part of the reason is there is this huge uh, streamer and entertainment aspect to chess currently. So there's this guy, Levy Roseman. I call him the Mr. Beast of chess. He's kind of the biggest chess content creator out there. He's an international master which is still a very good player, but not a grandmaster. He just rips YouTube videos, mm. views. It's unbelievable. Like his views, videos get multi-millions. It's him breaking down popular chess matches. He broke down the chess cheating controversy. He's really one of these influential figures. But then also on TikTok, and this is, I'm speaking from personal experience, there are like four or five different chess influencers that have popped up on TikTok recently who are not even good players. Like some of them are extremely low level players that people just love watching because it's almost like more, you see yourself in them mm -hmm. because it's hard to relate to these international masters, these grand masters. So there's this whole like workers, man, like crop of players who are really bad at chess, all things considered, but are great entertainers. They're just entertaining. Yeah. It feels like a very good Twitch thing. Right. It's definitely a Twitch thing, but I, I've seen some TikTok native people too, where like you, they are clearly building their biggest audiences on TikTok. Some of them don't even show their face; they're just commenting over their playing. Um, and I, I do think it's funny though that you're you're watching these 600 rated players while it's the equivalent of watching like a men's league like flag football game instead of watching the NFL. But again, sometimes that's a little more relatable. What's your rating these days? 
I'm right around like 1200, 1100 okay. or something like that. It's not, it's not great, Neil. It's not great. <laughs> Let us know in the comments if you want to see me and Chet, me and Toby play chess against each I other. I think Neil is better than me. I think it, it would be competitive. Yeah, it'd be a fun one. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, that is our Toby's trend for the week. Let's take the show home. Um, so, Neil, we started off the show with some spicy kind of courtroom drama s- surrounding Dominion and Tucker Carlson. And we're finishing the show with some spicy courtroom drama as well. So we've got a music copyright trial in our hands that kicked off yesterday. It pits Ed Sheeran in his song Thinking Out Loud against Marvin Gaye's famous song, Let's Get It On. I'm not going to sing either of those. <laughs> you have to just imagine those in your head. So according to the suit filed by the family of the songwriter who co-wrote the song with Marvin Gaye, the heart of Ed Sheeran's song is too similar to Let's Get It On. So Sheeran denies this and says that if the two s- songs sound alike, it's because the use of fundamental music building blocks that don't fall under copyright protection. So this is a big deal in the music world. It involves one of the, like, the underlying parts of musical composition, the melodies, chords, um, and of the two songs, not necessarily like the lyrics or anything like that. Yeah. So it's kind of a, setting a precedent, w- whichever way the court rules, on how the music industry is going to be governed going forward. This is BS. You're not. This on- is total BS. We, I listened to both songs beforehand, and they have a similar chord progression. This this case hinges on whether the the chord progressions are identical and whether Sheeran ripped off Gay's chord progression. They're not even identical. Yeah. There, there. As Sheeran says, there's only 12 notes in music. You can accuse Sheeran of being a lazy songwriter and, you know, maybe just like a basic pop artist who uses four chords. But every pop artist uses the same sort of four or five chords in their songs. You can. Everyone's seen that four chords video where they play, you know, 30 songs over the past five decades that all have the same chord progression, and you can go from one to the next to the next to the next seamlessly. Yeah. This is absurd and Sheeran thinks it's absurd and he's taking and a lot of other musicians that have been hit with similar copyright lawsuits have settled but Sheeran says no I want I really want to prove a point here like stop with these lawsuits right. like I didn't rip you off there's only there's a zillion other core a zillion other songs with the same exact chord progression yeah. maybe these two have similar themes about you know right <laughs> making yeah. whoopee but um <laughs> yeah I, one of the things I think it's so funny that musicologists are weighing in on this because you do need to bring in like scholars of music theory in order to like really get down to if this is a unique chord progression or not. And one of the evidence submitted in the case is the fact that this chord progression is found in guitar textbooks. So it's clearly like uh, the basis. It is very simpler. It's simple. Right. So I, I do think a lot of people in the music industry are hoping Ed Sheeran comes out on top of this because if not, like it really throws a wrench into like what is free use it, it, it would become very hard to create music without being sued by yeah. someone else who said, I've done that first. If you're using a sample with lyrics, like if you're ripping a sample, then obviously you're, you have yeah. to get a license. But this is like beyond the pale. I, I hope Ed Sheeran wins for all musicians, for all really lazy pop musicians. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That is our show. You can always reach us at Morning Brew Daily at morningbrew.com. Thanks to everyone in our control room. It's busy. It's a party over there. The show's producer and editor is Emily Milliron. Our supervising producer is Bryce Belloff. Our technical director is Yuchenna Waogu. APs are Sam Velas, Henry Stockwell, and Raymond Liu. Billy Menino. Menino is on audio. Dan Bauza is our VP of Technical and Production Operations. Hair and makeup got traded to the Jets. De- Devin Emery is our Chief Content Officer. Our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back tomorrow. Tomorrow.